everybody. I know it's cold and rainy. It was really hard for me to get out of bed. I'm sure it was for you guys as well. Um, let's see, just real quick before we get started, um, who here is their first time here? Yeah. Okay, sweet. And what about uh, entrepreneurs? How many entrepreneurs are almost entrepreneurs, done entrepreneurs? Okay, so almost half the, the room. Awesome. Thank you. Um, just a couple quick announcements. I just got noticed today, this morning, that all of our videos are up uh, online, and the Beyond Creative guys, I don't see them in the room, but their office is literally like right behind that wall. So a uh, big shout out to them. They help us out by uh, putting all the videos up there, and they help us out with some of the live streaming. Uh, as you guys all know, this is a volunteer organization, so uh, we'll take all the help we can get. So thanks for them, and if, uh, if you see them, give them a shout out. Um, if you guys haven't registered before, all, you know, all of our stuff is online. We ask you to connect with us uh, on Facebook, Twitter, all that social media, whatnot. Um, as for the format of the, of the show today, it's always the same. We're going to do a six to eight minute presentation. And then after that, we'll do Q&A. And uh, during the Q&A, if you could stand up out of your seat and wait for a microphone and then ask uh, the questions in the microphone because it all goes uh, online. And then that way, the presenter and the rest of the crowd can hear you. And without further ado, uh, Clayton Cooper is going to be our first presenter with Circle of Denim. All right. <laughs> okay, thank you, Devin. Uh, hello, my name is Clayton Cooper, and my company is called Circle of Denim. Uh, to make it simple, I buy and sell used jeans. Uh, buy men's jeans, women's jeans, I'll even buy jeans with holes in them. Uh, clothing resale is not a new business, uh, it's been around forever. Uh, some major, major players in the game would be uh, up, Uptown Cheapskate, Plato's Closet, The Goodwill. My business is a little different though. I too would operate out of a storefront where I'd buy and sell clothing. I would also sell used jeans at convenience stores, truck stops, online, as well as offer custom denim repair in the store. Uh, if you think of clothing resale like in terms of filters, uh, Plato's Closet, The Goodwill, It'd be like a coffee filter for clothing. Uh, my business would be more like a, a Brita filter. Okay? Let me take you back to the, the beginning, where this all began, where the, the concept was really born. This lovely lady, her name is Billy Baker. I grew up next to her. Uh, I called her Grandma Billy. Anytime she saw me with a hole in my jeans, she insisted that I leave my jeans with her and get them repaired, and she'd send them back to me. This pair of jeans was really the birth of the idea. I uh, got them probably junior year of high school, retired them uh, about senior year of college. About seven years of uh, consistent feedback, not just from my friends, but more importantly from strangers. would come up to me, ask me, where'd you get your jeans, or uh, can I buy those jeans from you? And uh, basically, I ended up retiring those jeans, but it left, left me with a, a vision, a vision of repaired denim. So I started pursuing this. Uh, the only thing I knew to do, I was going to start a clothing line. Um, I went to LA, got manufacturing set up, I had the wash house all ready, uh, denim supplier. Everything was ready to go, but when it boiled down to it, they couldn't achieve my vision. So uh, this is some of the samples we, were cr we created. Um, basically the first set of samples, the final set of samples when I realized that this was not what I had envisioned. So I started pursuing uh, other alternatives. 2011, I bought my first sewing machine, started repairing my own jeans. Um, started studying denim repair and the current methods used out there. Uh, worked alongside the owner of AAA Alterations here in Springfield. <clears throat> and really started to understand where the industry was as far as uh, their methods of denim repair. I, I improved upon those methods myself to what I am today. And uh, I envisioned at this point starting a denim repair service out of my house. I quickly realized that was not going to generate cash flow to, to take this where I wanted it to go. So I was kind of stuck. Um, then I started, that's, then I started, uh, and then I interned at a small clothing resale boutique here in town. An unpaid internship uh, for about four or five months, just kind of studying clothing resale, the competition here in Springfield as well as nationwide. I learned that Plato's Closet has over 300 locations. They generate roughly one million in average gross revenue per year, per location. Uh, in 2012, the Goodwill did 2.69 billion in sales. Uh, 
Not all of that was clothing or jeans, but a good portion of it was, I believe. I was also fortunate enough to watch Uptown Cheapskate uh, launch their first location here in town, uh, which I think was pretty beneficial. Basically, it was starting to take shape. Uh, clothing resale made sense as a stable, sustainable launching pad for this vision. So I decided it was time to move. Um, I started, I partnered with Victory Mission uh, early 2013 and I started buying what made it through their filter, uh, name brand jeans with holes in them, minor stains in them. And I found a company in St. Louis that was uh, heavy in denim and I went up there twice, about 2,300 pounds each time, sorted through them and picked out anything I thought had any kind of value. As I did this, I started to really understand the life of denim. What goes through the filters, what doesn't, um, and where there's maybe some value that hasn't been captured. So I started to test alternative markets with my inventory. Um, I had one rack. I put one rack in a gas station here in town. Kept it there for three and a half months. Uh, then I had to pull it out because I ran out of jeans. Um, I started to play around online with my method of denim repair and the variations that I came across with, with the inventory that I had. I was trying to hone in on uh, the market that currently is composed of a whole lot of do-it-yourselfers. Uh, no, no true leader in this market that I've found. So, kind of brings me back to today. Basically, I'm here, the next step that I see is I'm researching ways of raising capital. Uh, I'd like to get this business out of my garage, which is located at the bottom of clothing resale, into a storefront like a Plato's closet that's located at the top. Uh, my goal is after launch. I want to be the first choice when I cut, when anybody thinks of reselling their jeans, they bring them to me because I think I can take more jeans than any, any competitor out there and, and create a value out of it. Uh, I want to solidify and grow my back-end operations, online, truck stops, denim repair. And I want to improve my, my brand awareness as well as improve the entire model. I think there's, there's avenues out there that I haven't been able to tap yet. So why am I here today? Well, I'm ready to insert this filter into a market. And currently my business plan calls for $100,000. And I would like to ask the first question, has anybody here ever raised capital to start a business? And if so, how'd you do it? Thank you for your time and I open it up for questions. Folks, just raise your hand if you have a question. You mentioned you uh, selling truck stops. That's kind of new to me. Uh, I know we've talked about it before, but uh, you sold out really, really fast, and you weren't able to keep up with the inventory. Can you keep, uh, tell us about that? Uh, yes. I, uh, Briarwood One Stop is a gas station in between Springfield and Republic out Sunshine. Uh, funny story, my, the, old, the old lady that started this whole thing, um, her, her, I guess it'd be her daughter, owns that gas station. So that's how I got into that one. Um, and yeah, I ran out real fast. I learned a lot. Uh, learned where the market was in a gas station, which was interesting. Um, and yeah, basically, that's all I really want to say today is that I ran out fast in about three months. So, <laughs> sorry. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, are you hoping? Uh, are you hoping to create a brand name? Uh, well, yes. I would like people to hear Circle of Denim and think, I could take my jeans there. I, w I want this guy to think, I could take my jeans to Circle of Denim. I want that guy to think, I could take my jeans to Circle of Denim. I want everybody in this room to think, oh, I've got a pair of jeans, because I know you do. And I want you to think, I could take my jeans to Circle of Denim, and they, they will probably buy them. That's what I want people to think. I noticed in your pictures you had some uh, <coughs> patches on there, white cloth with black paisley. Yes. You saw that in a truck stop? Paisley? No, sir. No, sir. That, that would be actually the, uh, the more the upcycled online sales, uh, currently the do-it-yourselfers that I mentioned. 
uh, that would be where I'd be competing with those. Um, also, the denim repair, that's, that's kind of the work that I could do in a storefront if you brought me a pair of jeans. I could also make them uh, maybe not as out there, if you prefer that. Okay. And then sizes. Uh, does it run across the board, or do you have trouble finding certain sizes? I buy any size that is available on the market today. And I sell any size that's available on the, on the market today. The main size ranges, women would be 0 to 16. Men would be 28 to 38. Those would be the main sizes that I would focus on. But if they make it, I can buy it. So I don't make the sizes. They're already there. Can you speak a little bit about uh, barriers to entry and scalability? Um, barriers to entry. Getting the storefront off the ground is tough. Um, barriers to entry, I think the best barrier to entry for me to create for any competition would be the first one in the market, to capture the market. Um, scalability, Playlist Closet operates in 300 locations. They'll, the, these filters work in markets similar to Springfield, sometimes smaller, sometimes larger. Um, here in town, my business, business model has plenty of room to grow. Um, currently, I don't really know how many jeans I can get to stock out how many gas stations and consistently keep that inventory rolling. Um, I'm interested to find that out. I've got a client that is uh, looking at Cheapskate, Uptown Cheapskate, and they were looking in the St. Louis market, and several of the suburbs had a ban on resale clothing stores. Have you come across that at all? Do you know why that might be? I have not come across that. I, uh, I will certainly, <laughs> certainly in, uh, research that. That's interesting. No, I haven't come across that. Thank you. For the $100,000, are you looking to in gain employees and that sort of thing? Or by a building, what are you trying to do with the $100,000? Um, it, it includes working capital, it includes rent for a building, not looking to buy one. Um, it does employ, or include employment, uh, labor, um, opening inventory. Yeah, uh, the basic things you would find, I think, in a, in a startup package. Who's your primary market? Male, female, what age range? Uh, well, that depends on the avenue of business that I'm in. Uh, the storefront would be similar to uh, Plato's Closet. I think their, their primary market is uh, 14 to 24-year-old females. Secondary market would be uh, 24 to 40, including their moms. Um, men, men would be a market I would serve, but not my main target. Um, online, I believe that market parallels the in-store market as far as the online customization. Denim repair, that market I'm not super certain about. Uh, depends on who wants to buy a new pair of jeans or get their whole repaired. I believe that market's very broad. And the uh, gas station market is slightly different. So for like a, a single pair of jeans, what would you say the normal cost is to acquire and repair one uh, versus the actual, like, uh, like the sales and then the, the cost to sell? So just, uh, just, just are you talking about the online, like do-it-yourself repair <coughs> online model? In, in general. So, uh, you know, you've probably got, you know, uh, a cost associated with acquiring jeans, average yes. cost to repair jeans, how much do you sell jeans? The, uh, the cost of the jean is going to vary greatly. Um, if it's a gently used, name brand, good jean, that's going to cost a lot more. Um, if it's a, uh, a good name brand with holes in it, maybe a minor stain, nobody else will buy it, that market's donation only. So I don't know where the acceptable bottom is that, to that one. Um, the repair side of the business, I've, I've got a very efficient method that I use. and so. Uh, the cost of acquiring them, repairing them, and getting them up is uh, pretty minimal. Talk a little bit more about if somebody brought you money 
how that would be structured in your mind and how that would be returned back to the investor? Well, um, right now, right now, I am, I am researching uh, methods of doing this, but right now I would say um, it would be an equity share. Uh, the investor would be more of, a, more of a, a silent investor on the clothing side of things. I would happily accept uh, business advice because that's uh, certainly <laughs> not something I know much about. Well, I can't say that. Um, but it's something, something I, would, I would accept advice on in, in avenues, but uh, um, as far as the, uh, the clothing side of things, um, they would be more of a silent investor, um, but they would be an equity share of some sort. I got a question for the, uh, for the, the crowd. So Clayton and I have been talking for a long time before he applied to present, and uh, I just had some jeans I wanted to get fixed, and I got a lot of clothes that sit around. How many people here have at least, a couple, at least one pair of jeans that they could sell right now if, if they knew that they could get cash for it? So just about everybody, okay. And so what about uh, who here has a pair of jeans that they need restored that they haven't like sent to an alteration shop or whatever? Is that a potential market? Okay, so significantly. Less. So I'll ask. But, but they all have many, jeans. To, how, many, to how, many, how, many people, uh, how many people have that favorite pair of jeans that they wore, got a hole in the knee, and now it's sitting in the back of your drawer? Clayton, uh, if you launch out here in Springfield, do you think that Springfield, Missouri is a decent enough test market to have accurate information to pilot in another city? Or would it be best to pilot in another city versus Springfield? Um, you know, there's pros and cons of going into other cities as opposed to Springfield, but I view Springfield as a, as a kind of a unique market. Uh, high student population, and low, low competition. For about 10 years, Plutus Closet was the only clothing reseller that would actually buy and sell clothing uh, that did it on any, any sizable scale. Plutus Closet moved into the market, or Uptown Cheapskate moved into the market um, in 2012. And basically, you can, you can kind of tell who's number one and two based on checking out their denim supply. Um, I, I think Springfield is a, a good market. Plato's Closet here in town is, is one of their top quartile stores. Uh, it generates um, about one and a half million dollars in gross revenue. Um, so they, they have a solid business here. Uh, that would also pose as a, uh, a, a stiff competition because they're entrenched. So it'd be a, a good, good chance to maybe prove the business model. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm kind of indifferent. Uh, do you have like a 10 year plan on how you're going to get into more gas stations or convenience stores, <laughs> truck stops? Do you have like a solid 10 year plan? Uh, it's a lot shorter than 10 years. You go as fast as you can. Um, <laughs> you know, right now it's, it's, it's the storefront location and buying jeans and, and starting to work this filter. Um, 10 years? I've got plans for 10 years, yes. But um, this, the I'm not, I'm not going there today. Uh, the, the initial plan is uh, the storefront, three years, grow and solidify in the market I'm in, improve the business model, perfect it, and then consider other alternatives. Um, Plato's Closet and those other guys sell a, a lot more than just jeans. Do you mm -hmm. feel like the market's still going to be substantial enough without going to alternative, you know, like shoes Blouses, and tops. shoes, tops, I mean, t-shirts. Yeah. Um, you know, my, my main goal is uh, to be the first in clothing resale. I want that first option. I want to I be the filter above Plato's Closet, and they can have whatever I leave. And so it's to be determined, I guess you'd say. Right now I envision uh, being able to buy those things, um, but if I can fill the shelves with denim, and customers are coming all day long, I'll stay away from the other stuff. Hi. Um, I was wondering, I like your idea of hygiene repair, 
Thank you. And uh, I was wondering if you've ever considered custom gene work, and then I also would like to know how you're doing marketing and if you're using Craigslist at all. Um, well, my, my question to you, custom gene work, what do you mean by that? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, currently, I my methods. I can personally customize your genes as far as creating the hole and then repairing it. As far as uh, bedazzling the pockets or whatnot, um, I have considered that. I don't. I don't think it'd be terribly hard to learn how to do. Um, so yeah, it'd be an option for sure. And what was your second question? Craigslist. Oh, Craigslist. Yeah, uh, I did actually. I, I kind of flirted around on Craigslist for a while, but it's not where I found the market. I was trying to buy them and sell them on Craigslist, and it just wasn't uh, efficient, I guess. What, what about uh, warranties and that kind of thing? Uh, people, you know, you pick something in a truck stop off a shelf there, off a rack, you, I don't know where to go try them on and everything, but then, but then, what about a warranty? Like the zipper goes bad, or, or you know something, yeah, like that. Well, uh, I guess I'd just go current where the where the market is currently. Uh, Plato's Closet. Uh, they don't accept very many exchanges. Once you leave the store, it's a used piece of clothing. Um, so once you leave the store, it's it's basically yours. Uh, truck stops, gas stations. Uh, the price point, you don't need to try them on. That's not what the market does. It's, it's more of an impulse buy at that point. And so, um, you know, you buy a hat at a truck stop, that's gonna, be up to the truck, that's gonna be up to the owner of the gas station. That does not come back on me. Excuse me. Um, have you thought about, instead of trying to create a whole new store and business front, instead being like a, a branded uh, line of clothing inside of Plato's closet, like be their ultimate brand? You thought, thought about that? Well, <laughs> uh, well, no. I guess, no, not exactly like that. But um, Plato's Closet's business model buys all jeans. They buy all clothing. And so I would basically have to kind of throw this in the trash and start talking to LA again to actually try to do that. That's what they do. They just buy jeans. People bring them in there and they just buy them up all day long. So to be like a sole brand for them is not a, a possibility. And I did approach them about buying whatever made it through their filter and they didn't, didn't want to do that. So. Not, not, uh, just having your own rack in there, like, so they still buy oh. jeans from whoever, but you're oh. going to be a special section of the store. Yeah, they're not a consignment store. That's consignment, what you're talking about. They're not a consignment store. Um, there are consignment stores that, that you know, you can do things like that. Um, that's kind of smaller time. Uh, it's not necessarily where my vision is at right now. So uh, what kind of margins are you making, like, average per, per pair of jeans? And when you put them in a gas station, are you making any money? You got to buy the jeans, you got to repair the jeans, you got to cut them in. I do, I, I do not repair those jeans. Oh, you just sell them, you just flip them. Mm. Okay, gotcha. So are you uh, paying the gas station then per unit? Are you keeping an inventory? Are they figuring out what are they, I mean, they're selling them for you, I take it. Yes. So are they taking a commission off of that per gene? It's set up more of a consignment in the gas station. Okay, gotcha, cool, mm -hmm. interesting. So what's your like average, you know, what are you making per pair of jeans average? I mean, you, you got to have some. I do know. But no. <laughs> gotcha. I'm sorry. I appreciate the question, but I. Well, Clayton, every week we wrap up with the same question. What can we as a community do to help you? Uh, well, like I said, I'm researching ways to raise capital. So uh, if you've ever done it, you've ever raised capital, come talk to me. I'd love to get any advice, any and all advice that I can uh, raising capital, I, I think, you know, not only to help my business venture, but uh, I'd like that knowledge so I can pass it on to the next person. So um, you got any experience doing that? Uh, let me know about it. And, yeah. Thank you, uh, Clayton. Thank you. Nicely done. Hey, some quick announcements. Um, the monthly real estate investor meeting 
um, is usually held the third Thursday of each month. Brad Moncada was here, so if anyone has any questions about that, please see Brad after the meeting. Also, the annual Mob Expo uh, meeting is uh, starts tomorrow at 4 p.m. at the Expo Center on St. Louis. And any Mob members here, that's Masters of Business? Several here, great. Also, uh, this is for entrepreneurs that have some interest in getting into Walmart. Uh, Walmart is doing a, I guess this is the first time they've done this, this is a open call summit on July the 8th in Bentonville. So you might make a note of that, and uh, I'm sure this is probably on the Walmart uh, website, I assume. Let's see if we, yes, it's under walmart.com events made in the USA open call summit, if anyone's interested in that. So uh, if anyone has any announcements that has any relevance to entrepreneurship, please bring that to Chad, myself, Devin, or Rick, and we'll make sure we get this in the uh, announcements. Our next presenter is uh, Alex Scott with Metro Shine. And uh, Alex, got the floor. Right, please. How are you guys doing today? Good. All right. Well, my name is Alex Scott. I own a company called Metro Shine Company, and we are a waterless car wash company. So we can wash cars without any water. Um, we use basically these two products right here to clean your entire car. And I you know, argue that we do it better than any of your tunnel washes or water washes can do it. Um, this product right here is our pre-wash product. That takes off everything. The brake dust, the bugs, the nasty juices on the bottom of the car, the, uh, the uh, love bugs if you're in Florida. Um, so, you know, the, the salt and the mad chloride if you're in Denver, um, stuff like that. So that's what that product does. This product does everything else. This is a product that we um, created that basically does everything, all the paint, the windows, the plastics, the inside of the cars, everything. So with these two products, inside and out, we wash the whole car. This, car, this product also is a great spot remover for, for stains and carpets as well. So with these two products, and then we also have a tire shine. And our tire shine is a water-based tire shine. Um, in other words, it doesn't leave that greasy, nasty film that a lot of people, whenever they, you know, especially in this area, you know, when you drive down a dirt road after you're in your car clean, you get home and your tires are nice and brown. So the, uh, but our tire shine is water-based. It looks like a new tire instead of like one of those greasy tires. All of our products are green. They're uh, basically made with plant-derived ingredients. They also have a, uh, you know, just have been tested by VOCC. We've gone through a lot of testings with them, basically. Um, the nice thing about what we can do is with just these products is that we can wash your car anywhere. It doesn't matter where. It, um, because we don't make any runoff. In other words, we don't have to worry about you know, the neighbor or the parking garage, the facility. We can wash next to a stream, a lake, you know, a river, whatever, and you know, the EPA doesn't run screaming at us and finding us because we don't, basically we don't have anything that touches the ground. So all of the uh, dirt, debris, and the, and the uh, stuff that comes off the car goes into one of these. And these are microfiber towels. This is all we use. These are extremely soft. And once they get filled with dirt, we just basically throw them in the washing machine. So the dirt from your car, instead it goes through the storm sewer or through the, you know, through a bunch of water and into the uh, sanitary sewer, it goes through your washing machine and out. So um, we do a lot of places. So like, let's say you're working, like you're just for instance, like Plaza Towers or BKD or something like that. You know, you can go online, you can uh, reserve a car wash, you can pay for the car wash and then we show up and wash your car. So whenever you get done with work that day, you come out to a nice clean car. So it's a little bit unique than just basically running through a tunnel wash somewhere or on your way home. It takes a lot less time. Shopping the same way, uh, we're in malls in Florida and in New York City. Um, we also like at restaurants, you know, whenever you're going to eat somewhere, you can get your car washed. And uh, th through Springfield Parking Company, which is another company that I own, uh, we offer the Metro Shine car wash through like uh, our valet parking. So if you're going to Flame Restaurant and you ask the attendant, hey, I want my car wash, we can do that or Touch Restaurant or any of the events, you know, downtown and stuff like that. So um, 
so that's pretty much around here is where you can get your car wash. And then um, we also do a lot of fleet washes. So we have, I tell you what, we have locations right now in New York City, uh, around LaGuardia, uh, JFK airports, downtown Manhattan, midtown Manhattan, um, also uh, in Tampa, Jacksonville, and Orlando, and then Denver, Denver downtown, and Denver International uh, airports. And one of the things that a lot of times we see around airports is that you cannot get your, they say you have these big shuttle, passenger shuttles going back and forth to the airport from hotels or car rental companies like that. You know, they, they have to go like six, eight miles away from the airport to find some place, a facility to wash your car. Or they're sitting back there with employees doing the power washing thing, praying to God that the EPA doesn't come by at the same time and catches them. Because with a, uh, anywhere within a, usually a few miles of the airports that they're caught washing, the minimum fine from dished out is usually $500. And I've heard that, you know, fines going up to 5000 or $10,000 as well, just for basically letting water run onto the ground. So, the, uh, so what we do is we provide a solution for them. We can go in there, we can wash their fleet vehicles, their shuttles. We've even done city buses, even articulated buses as well. So anything from just cars to articulated buses, we can wash. It just takes more time in a lot of people. So um, that's some of the stuff we can do with fleet washes. And then here's some of the uh, difference between what we do. Um, of course, our products are all organic. Um, environmentally safe. We use basically with this product right here I can wash two vehicles with this much product. And uh, of course no runoff and no expensive um, separators or reclaim systems. Of course low water they may require um, some type of you know catching uh, equipment where they have to catch the water or catch the runoff. And then the traditional they have to have reclaims and separators and everything like that. And a, a normal reclaim and a separator would cost somewhere between Two hundred fifty to five hundred thousand dollars, depending on where you put it. So, in some of the markets that we're in, I mean, just to buy a a car wash permit, just to be able to put one in there, is usually two times or three times more than it costs to build the car wash. So, we offer that solution for them too. And there's our menu. Now, people are like, "Oh my gosh, why in the world are you guys so expensive?" Well, the reason is is that um, we all of it's done by hand. Um, it's whenever we're done with it, the products in this is like basically putting a wax on your car. Our car washes last two or three weeks compared to just a couple of days. The shine lasts, the, the, this product acts like rain x on your windshield and also the other paint. So if you don't have any wax on your car whatsoever and after we use this, you'll see the water bead, the water shed off, uh, be able to come off of, you know, the dust will be able to, you know, dust comes off easier, everything comes off easier after using this product. Um, but we offer the exterior wash for $19.99. Anything without a trunk we consider oversized. And you're thinking, okay, well, I have this little bitty SUV. And said, well, the reason we do that is because we have other people selling our product as a lot of times. So um, we have, like say at, at, at Denver International, um, one of our clients is Wally Park. <clears throat> and if you drive up to Wally Park and you use the valet and you get out and they're helping you with their baggage to get into the shuttle, what they're going to say is, hey, when you get back, would you like to have a clean car? So, you know, that's what that's our company basically to say, okay, here's what it is. It's $19.99, you know, $29.99, and they show the sign right there. So, um, but our car washes, like I said, are I feel like are superior to most tunnel washes. Um, then we do some some minor detail work. We can either let them have the, like a wax on the outside, or we can do like a mini detail on the inside. And then the all shine is basically you can do it, get it all there. So you can get both of them. And we sell, believe it or not, probably uh, our least, our worst seller is the outshine. So our best seller is the in and out. And then our second best seller is the all shine. And then we also, with our web based technology we have, we have a reservation system. You can go online. Um, you can pick this, uh, the location you're at, your office building, your work, your the mall, just whatever, you, you basically tell us when your car is going to be there and then we uh, basically, you can reserve it, you pay for it online and then we give you instructions on what to do with keys or find out where your car is and then when you come out at the end of the day or when you're done, you know, your car is all clean and nice and ready to go. So, and we do that online. So that actually, we may never even see our customers. So our customers may be in and out without us even, you know, ever seeing them. 
And there are some before and after pictures because everybody says, well, I don't believe you and I have to see it to believe it. And honestly, it's raining outside, so there you go. So, so that's some of the, the, the stuff. You can see like the bird nasty stuff on there and some of the dust on there. And then after we're done, obviously, it's a whole different vehicle, even the tires. And then we do a lot of fleet. There's some of the fleet vehicles that we do. We do uh, 80 of these Wally Park shuttles every week. So, and that's up in New Jersey, and you can see the salt and stuff. That's before and after pictures as well. And that's pretty much, in a nutshell, what Metro Shine Company is. You know, one of the things that I was going to ask about you guys, and of course all your other questions, is, you know, one of the biggest uh, challenges we have is getting the people to the website. Because the last thing in the world people are ever thinking about is washing their car. When they're driving by the tunnel and they look down and they see, oh gosh, I have a dirty car, they, they, they fly in. But to get them to think about that car wash while they're doing something else, it's just, it's a little bit of a challenge. So, you know, um, we've been tackling it since 2011 and, uh, you know, always looking for new inventive ways to be able to get those people um, onto the website. And then, of course, investors roll, roll out to other markets. Um, you know, it's cheap to put one of these car washes in compared to a, a normal car wash. We're talking a couple million dollars. We can do it for $1,500 to $2,000 to put a car wash in. However, I live in Springfield, Missouri. So travel is, is the, main, the main expense to do that, hiring and all that kind of stuff. So at the end of the day, the time we market and everything else, it costs about $40,000 to market to put in a... Uh, to do a car wash. And then once we start our first car wash, then we go into like a, kind of like what you would do like a, um, a strip store. So you would, if you're gonna build a strip store, you, you always get your main tenant, your anchor tenant. So that's the same thing we do. We get our anchor customer that's in that market and then we build out around it. So anyway, okay. that's it. That took a little longer than supposed to, sorry. <laughs> So are you looking to franchise or uh, is the, are these all independently owned or how does that work? No, we're not looking to franchise. We may at some point do some license agreements like overseas, um, you know, do some stuff like that. But at this point, you know, I want them all. At, honestly, it's because the reason is, and people are like, well, why don't you franchise is, is because this is a very high quality business. In other words, if I have a franchisee or something like that that doesn't perform to my ability, to my liking, you know, it's really hard to get rid of them. So um, what I'd much rather have is the control and the ability to change a manager, change out the employees, be able to go in there and, and structurally clean house, you know, with the market where I can change it myself. Plus, we have a lot of, like Wally Park, they're a national company. They're in all up and down the East Coast, all up and down the West Coast, all through Florida. Um, you know, Chicago, Wisconsin, they're growing too. They're building about three locations a year as well. And they're wanting us in every location as fast as they can get them up. So, you know, to be able to, uh, to do that, I got to have the freedom and ability to do it on my own. I've got a black vehicle. My first thought is you're going to rub dirt in and scratch my paint. Yeah, that's what everybody says. The, uh, <laughs> and that's, that's where this product is different from us. You know, we've washed somewhere in the neighborhood of 50-some thousand vehicles with this. And um, we have never had anybody complaining about scratching. Um, the reason is is because, uh, number one, unless it's, if it's really dirty, so let's say it comes off, you know, a mud, like a mud bogging and it's covered in head and toe dirt, I'm not afraid to say, you know what, you need to go wash that truck off, bring it back to me, and I'll make it shine. So I'm not, I'm not afraid to turn one down, um, first off. Second off is that this product has polymers in it. It kind of acts like a barrier between the paint and the dirt. So as soon as you spray it on, the, uh, it immediately bonds to the paint and bonds to the dirt at the same time, creating a chemical barrier between that. And then this towel is an extremely soft towel. And we, go through probably, you know, between five and 15 of these per vehicle. So once they start getting dirty, we just throw them in the, uh, the laundry. Because we have thousands of these, and I tell my employees whenever I train them, it's like, you know what, you guys, there's, there's no reason to hold on to a dirty towel. So as soon as they start getting soiled, stuff like that, they go into the laundry, they pick up a new towel. So we've never had any issues with scratching, even in black vehicles, so. So I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One, you said you have a proprietary product, right? 
So is there anything else on the market for waterless car wash Tons. products? Okay. Tons. And then is there a reason you haven't explored selling your products as a kit to companies like Wally Park so that they can do it themselves with their own employees? And um, we, we do that some. We have uh, packages that we do with rental car companies. So um, like Hertz, we're working with Hertz right now to basically give them packages training videos, the whole works with them for all their locations that doesn't have the ability to go out and you know, have wash facilities on site or if they do have um, like a car wash somewhere in the neighborhood, they're living in a high dense area where it's not practical to take a car to a car wash two or three miles away. So this is a perfect solution for, for Hertz, for Enterprise. We sell products uh, like this to Advantage out in California, Los Angeles, New York, stuff like that, Advantage Rental Car. Um, but as far as selling it to the public, we are going to do that eventually. But right now, I have my hands so full with just getting the service part of it up. It's not even a, it's not even a thought right now. Yes. Do you, do you uh, have a patent on those chemicals, or can anybody imitate this? Anybody can imitate it. And the reason is that we don't have a patent on it, because you could take this product, and you can turn it red, and it's a different product. So we don't, I don't mess, waste the money to do, to patent the product. Um, so the, uh, and there's also, a, there's a lot of car wash chemicals out there available on, on the web that you can buy and do it yourself, you know, if you wanted to. What we are looking at maybe is, um, is uh, basically patenting the process, because we have some unique stuff that we do to, that we've learned over the years and over the cars to be able to patent that part of it. But as far as the product goes, it's not going to do it. Has anybody in here seen Pulp Fiction? Remember that movie? Yeah. And the, the fella in the back seat? Yeah. Uh, when, you have a, when you have a facility, <laughs> you remember that movie, right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I've seen a how, how many uh, personnel? Uh, you know, you're going to have a facility, mm -hmm. right? Well, we don't have facilities. So you we use somebody yep. else's facilities. Okay. So then uh, you have to... Uh, get your crew there. How many people are going to be in a typical crew? Two. Two? Yep. Two okay. people um, can wash, do an exterior wash in about 15, 20 minutes. So um, in and out in about 30, 35 minutes. An all shine, which is the worst one, hour and a half. And they're done. So that's the, even actually less than that, maybe an hour, you know, to do it. And the, we train everybody to, uh, it, there's two reasons they do that. Number one is that we don't pay anybody by the hour. So everybody's paid by the piece. So there's two reasons for that. Number one, they're fast. And number two, if I don't get paid, they don't get paid. So the, uh, the idea is, is that we do, they do a high quality work, they do it as fast as they can. You know, they go back over it, we have checklists, and they go back over everything, make sure it's done right, you know, and stuff like that. So because if, honestly, if, and we have a, a strike rule, three strikes and you're out. So if I get three complaints, you know, or three times where I have to refund the money to a customer, then they're no longer employed. It sounds harsh, but honestly, that seems to work for us. So, How do you deal with liabilities? Is somebody saying that, you know, uh, clean my car, leave the keys under the mat, and then it's unlocked for the rest of the day? Um, you know, we deal with liabilities like anything else. You know, owning the valet company, I deal with that all the time. Um, you know, we have a, uh, the processes that we use with the car wash is the same with the valet. The, the, the keys get put up in a lot box until they're returned to the, to the customer. We don't ever leave a car unlocked as part of the checklist, you know, and then say if we, uh, if you're at working and you have, you know, want your car washed, then you leave your keys at the front desk, at the reception desk, and then we return the keys to the reception desk. And we put your car in the same place, so we use a cone. If we have to move your car for some reason, which we hardly ever, ever, ever have to do, but if we have to, we cone off that space, you know, and then return it to that space, so. Sounds like under this model of expansion, you're going to require a lot of employees for all the different mm -hmm. locations. Are you worried at all about the rising cost of wages and health care and Constantly. for those employees? Constantly, yeah. Um, it's one of those things is where you're like, you know, you pray that it doesn't happen, but if it does, plan for it. So, um, you know, we have, with our, with our model where we pay by the piece and stuff like that, we have to guarantee a minimum wage. So we keep track of their hours on it. But our guys usually make the neighborhood of 12 to $20 an hour at the end of the day after, after cleaning, after doing what they need to do. Because like the All Shine one, where they're making, where they're, uh, um, there it is, 
where they're, you know, we're charging $125, the, the employee's making $35 to wash that car. So, you know, so they're making, they're making pretty decent money on it. Alex, can you tell us a little bit about the pending contracts and business you have in LA and how that <coughs> ties into the investment opportunity that you're presenting today? Yeah, Wally Park um, has a, a facility where they park around between their two locations, LA, two locations in San Diego. They got about 6,000 parking spaces and they turn them over twice a week. So they're moving 12,000 cars in and out of there every week. And um, they currently have a water wash that they use right now that makes about that makes them uh, that revenue wise about three hundred fifty thousand four hundred thousand dollars a year, so but they're wanting to get away from that because number one is that they have, I think the uh, the permits for it and everything else is just ridiculous, is ridiculously expensive. Plus, it's just a, a management nightmare for them because it's just something else that they have to do. You know, they're not in the parking business or they're not in the car wash business. They're in the parking business, so you know, unfortunately, they're washing cars there, but. They're, they're wanting us to get in there pretty quick. So what we, what we need to do is, what we'll do is we'll get into uh, that contract, we'll get that contract up and running, switch it over to water, let's get it in MetroShine, um, install there, and then what we do is we start looking at other locations close by, and we kind of do a uh, kind of a small circle around that location, and then we start expanding that circle out until we want. And the reason we don't just immediately just go anywhere and everywhere it's because we got employees and they're paid by the piece. So in other words, I'm not paying them to drive 20, 30 minutes to go wash one or two cars. I'm wanting them to stay close to a certain area. So, you know, then we have those teams that stay in that area, then they move. Then if we're gonna go to another place, like say downtown LA, then that'll be a whole different set of employees and everything else. Did that answer your question somewhat? Well, so, so, so how does that translate to the potential investors? Um, you know, one them. of the things that we're looking for is like, you know, like I said, like $40,000 to move into a new market is about what it would cost us to do, sometimes more. Um, but, you know, what I'm looking for is an investor who can, you know, what I'm really looking for is an investor who can not only help us with LA, but help us with going out into Seattle, into um, like Chicago, um, Milwaukee, you know, up and down the East Coast and stuff like that who has the experience and the ability to go out there and, and help us manage it and help us grow it more so than just me doing it. So um, that's really what I'm looking for in an investor is, is not just a, somebody here, here's your money, but also somebody who can say, let's, you know, I already have the uh, capability out in that market. Why don't we, you know, work with that capability to, to kind of bring in Metro Shine to basically help manage it and help control it. Because, you know, one of the things is, one of the things that I've learned in this is that um, managing people from 700 out to 1,500 miles of the way is probably, I'll never do it again. So, <laughs> put it to you that way. So, so, that has been my challenge from day one. I'm lucky I have some really good managers in Florida. I got a good manager in New York. I got a decent manager in Denver. I got a good manager in Denver. We just got to worry about getting a, uh, um, you know, helping them grow. and. But when I'm not standing there, you know, looking over it all, you know, it's kind of hard to 100% know exactly what kind of quality and all that kind of stuff that's going on. So that kind of investor. Yeah, I'm kind of playing around on your website here, and, and it looks like you only have specific businesses that you have to get your car to. Mm -hmm. Do you find that a barrier as opposed to me putting in the address to the business that I work at? Yes and, and no. I understand what you're saying. The, um, the reason we do that is because we want to have permission from the, biz from the landowner to be able to go on there and to wash people's cars. Even though we're not using any water, even though we're not being, you know, not making an impact at all, it's always better to have that permission. Because the reason is, is say like we have uh, Park One down in downtown Denver. The management company, we went in there and we washed all the cars for the management company in there. They're 100% on board. They're wanting to market us, they're wanting to help us market. That's the only way that we found that we can be successful is that if we're at a, um, like at a big office building, is that if we have the management's approval and their say-so, I can litter their building with promotional material you know, and get people in there. So I can put signs up in the front at the ticket spitters, uh, at the entry, at all the uh, in, in, ingress and egress areas out of the parking garage. I can put signs up, I can, all my signs, 
they have QR codes, so all they have to do is with their iPhone as they walk by, they just scan the QR code, it takes it right to the website and stuff like that. So, but without just saying, okay, well, I just wanna show up at your place, that's fine and stuff like that, but we want to, our model is that we wanna be able to build a customer base at certain locations. So, and then be able to control where those locations are. Because if we're, let's say if I'm in down by the airport um, in LA and somebody rent, reserved a car wash an hour away, that means I gotta pay an employee to go an hour, you know, wash your car and then get back. So honestly, that doesn't make sense. So that's why we control where we wash cars within those locations, it's because of that. So. As you differentiate yourself from your competitors, is there something about the process that makes you guys unique? Um, you know, we have, we've been doing it a long time. We've uh, washed a lot of cars on it. As far as our, the water, waterless companies out there, there are a few out there. Um, one of the things that they have done is that when they don't have the web-based um, reserve system and pay on the system that they have, we're the only one that has that. And they all basically require, we, they don't do any fleet work. We do a ton of fleet work. Um, so waterless cr companies are like, man, we don't want to wash a bus or something like that with this. But we have methods and ways that we can wash like a larger vehicle, a large shuttle, even semi-trucks, you know, with this product where most companies look like that and say, no, it's not worth it for us. But we found ways that we can do it where it's worth it for us to do it. How much would you say that you spend in product and paying your employees and stuff like that per car on, let's say, like a super shine wash? We do it percentage wise. Um, the product is about one and a half percent, two and a half percent, you know, in that area, because it depends on how much we use. Um, the supplies to do it is probably another two and a half, three percent. And I don't mind telling you what it is, it's just, it is what it is. Employees run about 30 to 40 percent. So, you know, that's where, that's where our money is. Plus, we also, uh, you know, we basically, when we're going to a client, we have a little bit of room that we can do a kickback to the uh, property owner. So, like with Wally Park, what's their incentive for us to so we'll wash their customer car as well? Yeah, their customers are happy, but they want something too. So. Out of this package, which is your highest selling? That in and out shine. And then the second one is the all shine. So, I mean, the, the out shine and the all shine are about even. So. So Alex, who would be good leads for you here in Springfield? Uh, I think a lot of people want to get their car washed now, as, right. as the Twitter feed says. Right. Um, where can we get our car wash here besides touch and flame if we don't want to you know, grab some food you know, and get a car wash? You know, um, I, for, for the Springfield area, you know, just give me a call, let me know what you want, I will come out. You know, um, I do a lot of traveling, but you know, if I'm here, I'll do it. Um, I also have a couple employees that's, here, that's trained here to do it. So, um, you know, as far as other places go, we, we're at BKD. Uh, if you work at BKD, you can go online, you can get your car washed. If you work at the Plaza Towers, same thing. There's like, I think three or four uh, office complexes on the south side of town that's also set up. You just have to go online and look at it. If you want, us to, if you want your, your place of employment set up, go online, shoot me an email, and I can set you up online to reserve it and stuff like that. In the meantime, I will wash your car. We'll just come out there and do a cash transaction or something like that or a credit card over the internet. So can, so can the single retail client take their car to those business locations? Yeah. Or do they have to work? No, they can do that. Locations? If they, let's say like they're going to be at BKD for three hours or two and a half hours doing something, God help them. But anyway, if they are, so, you know, so if they are, they can go ahead and reserve a car wash, you know, let us know when they're going to be there and we can pay them. Sorry for the BKD people. So. Hey, Alex. Alex, um, it's just a tremendous concept. I've never seen anything like it before in my life. How did you come up with the concept, or where did you see it? To come uh, you know, up, to I didn't. To the next level. I didn't know anything about it until a friend of mine that uh, worked as a uh, operations manager for a large off airport parking company back in 2007, 2008 during the decline. All of a sudden, saw a huge drop off on their business parkers, which hurt the company tremendously. So they all of a sudden they felt like, wait, we got to figure out a way to, you know, get more revenue with the number of parkers that we have. So that's when they started to say, hey, we gotta start thinking about car wash, we gotta start thinking about oil changes, they started thinking about dry cleaning, they started thinking about all these pet, you know, pet boarding, everything, you know, just to try to make up for that. Car washing, you know, you know they look like, well, by the time they put a tunnel on there, they're looking at a minimum of a half a million dollars. So, you know, and we can, and I basically, he's telling me about the problem and we came up with this solution 
where that we can get it in a location for about 1500 So that's pretty much how it was born. And then after that, we just kind of kind of grew from there. So. Um, yeah, I was curious. Uh, you know, you obviously want to wash cars where there's a lot of cars. Have you thought about public? Public you know, parking? Public parking? Yeah, we have. But the biggest problem is they won't let us. So uh, public parking spaces like that, the, the county or the city has, has ordinances against doing anything for profit on their property. So unfortunately, yeah, they, they're just frowning on it. You can't even, if I was, a, even with my valet company, I can't even park on a public, you know, parking lot. You seem like you're mostly trying to market the service end of it. Mm -hmm. And I wondered, um, if you had considered just the product, whether it be to municipalities, to casinos, to car dealerships, things like that. We are, um, we have considered that. And we also, we're doing it, you know, we're doing that with like with rental car companies and stuff like that. Um, you know, at the same time, we're uh, some car dealerships as well, you know, where they have a showroom, so they don't want to take their cars out of the showroom to wash them. You know, we can wash, you know, they can wash your cars with this, you know, right there. Um, but yeah, I mean, we are considering that. That's, that's a couple of years down the road, you know, because honestly, to be able to do that, you have to package it, you have to find an outlet for it, you have to, and you know, one of the things that, nice thing about it is we've watched a lot of cars, we keep 90% of the, uh, of the uh, people that we wash cars for, so we can basically go out there and we have a pretty good size list. That means say, hey, this is available, you know, go online to buy it yourself. Another thing that we've done that we're looking at doing is like people who buy the Super Shines or the All Shines, we get a touch-up kit inside their car. So it would be a small little bottle, you know, maybe the size of maybe three or four ounce bottle, spray bottle with both these products and maybe one and a, uh, two microfiber towels with a little instruction booklet. Basically you say, hey, you know, you just spent $125 on washing your car, you know, and I, on your way home, nice bird made a nice deposit for you. So, you know, that would just, that would just tick you off, you know. So here's a, here's a little touch up kit for that reason. And then and inside it would give you the website and tell you, hey, this is how you get more of it. So let's say they have a, or like a favorite car at home, like a motorcycle or something like that, that they don't drive very often, you know, that all of a sudden they have a solution to be able to wash cars. So that's kind of the idea that we're headed for with marketing the product. Alex, it's 10 o'clock. We wrap up with the same question. How can we as a community help you? You know, my biggest question always is, is that um, how in the world do I get more people to my website? So, you know, without, we have a tons of signage, thousands and thousands of dollars in signage. Um, we do email blasts and everything else like that. But, you know, the idea is how do we drive more people to the website? Plus, you know, if anybody knows anybody or wants to invest, you know, says I'll be definitely willing to talk to somebody about that. So, Thank you. all right. Well, uh, that's going to wrap it up for uh, this week. And, and once again, I, I just want to thank you guys for coming together uh, as a community to help out these businesses and these entrepreneurs. Um, uh, I would urge you to, to reach out to the individual entrepreneurs. All their information is on our website. And after they present, uh, it, it goes into an archive. Um, and if you have some other uh, business owners or entrepreneurs that you think can benefit from this, uh, what they're receiving after this has really been tremendous and very beneficial for, for their businesses and for the community. Uh, just to give you guys a little bit of feedback, we started, I think, 12 weeks ago, and uh, it's really interesting. Springfield has had the, the, the biggest consistent turnout um, out of all the one million cups across the nation, and I think it's, it's a really unique timing situation uh, for the community and uh, for, for everybody here involved. So we thank you. Uh, we're here every week, and uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks.